Years ago, I prepared a paper that went as a kind of tract in New England. We used it at the Joseph Smith Memorial, titled Joseph Smith Among the Prophets. It was written, I thought, uh, to the non-Mormon. And the attempt was to categorize some eight or ten characterizations of prophets that have been typical in Judeo-Christian literature. For example, that a prophet is a foreteller of some sort. He has access uh, prophetically to the future. Also, to use the jargon, prophets have been called forth-tellers, meaning that they speak forth boldly in judgment and in recommendation of their own time. A prophet, too, is categorized as a man who has authority and speaks uh, with more than human sanction. He is a recoverer or a discoverer of truth. He is an advocate of social righteousness. He is a charismatic, which is a large word for one who, as a personality, seems to manifest something that attracts, particularly in a spiritual sense. He is one who endures suffering and radiantly. He is one who is embodiment of love. He is a seer, meaning that he has, again, the capacity to reveal, to clearly understand and reveal truth. And finally, among the great prophets of the past, many have been martyrs. Well, in that presentation, I simply showed that under each of those heads, Joseph Smith qualifies. If we use any of those to characterize a prophet, what can we say of a man who radiates them all? Today, more intimately now than the Judeo-Christian captions, we come to a kind of subjective approach to his glorious first vision. I would prefer to call it, for reasons that will shortly appear, his first visitation. Now let me begin with a little intellectual bookwork. Nearly uh, nine years ago, we published a collection in BYU Studies of the four known accounts, written accounts, of the first vision. One first recorded in 1832, then again 1835, after a visit he had with a Jewish visitor, Joshua his name, a Jewish authority. And then in 1838, the statement which has been published to the world in the Pearl of Great Price. And then finally, the well-known Wentworth letter written in 1842 to the Chicago Democrat, in which again the prophet briefly recapitulates his first vision. Uh, what we intended by that publication was not only to give, as we did, the actual holographs, that is the handwritten, he had different scribes, but in each case handwritten accounts as he dictated them but also articles by some of our own best scholars as to the context of all this. Let me then dwell for a few moments on the background. In the earliest account, Joseph says that even in the days that he was in Vermont, Vermont where even today there is little pollution and where the sky at night is clear and the Milky Way is milky, he would look up at night and marvel at the symmetry and the beauty and the order of the heavens. And something in him said, as has happened to sensitive souls from the beginning, something lies behind that. There must be a majestic creator to account for that majestic creation. But the contrast between that boyhood awareness and the confusion he saw down on this planet was not only difficult, 
it seared his soul. And the divisions that he describes in Palmyra were not simply among and between others, neighbors and friends. They were in his own family. We have recently shown that he had a, at least one relative in every church in Palmyra. So that the family was utterly spread. Order in heaven, disorder on earth. How can God be responsible for both? But the record also makes it transparently obvious that it hadn't ever occurred to him when he went in the grove that all of the then influential churches were in error. Notice that the question he put when he recovered himself, the question he put was not, is there a true church in the world? The question he put was, which church is true? He assumed at least one had to be. The answer was all the more striking and stark, therefore. Join none of them. Another interesting point about the background is that he had been struck. In fact, he says, no passage of Scripture ever came more strongly to a soul than mine. Struck by reading the Bible. We think we know that Reverend George Lane was the man who first recommended in Joseph Smith's hearing that one do that, and even that specific passage was mentioned in some of Reverend Lane's sermons. He was a Methodist, and he was associated with the revival of which I've spoken. We can't prove that he was this person. But Joseph later describes this uh, person who was, he says, identified with the aforementioned religious excitement. I can't imagine, and this to me is poignant, that at age 14, full as he was of the glory, the remarkable experience, and the excitement of it, going, and he says he did, he doesn't name George Lane, he says, I went to this man, told him what had happened, and you Remember, his response was instantly, Oh no, that could not be of God. Those sort of things don't happen anymore. So to recommend that one lacking wisdom ought to go and pray, let him ask of God, fair enough. But the answer seemed to this man too much. Heaven came too close. And it's almost as if, I repeat, the boy, pure-minded, spontaneous, even a little unrestrained, as teenagers are, should have been struck instantly in the moment of, wow, it worked. You told me to do this, I did it. And the response is, shucks, boy, it's all of the devil. And the smile slowly disappeared. And he learned early that to testify, even to hint, of divine manifestations was to stir up darkness and to call down wrath. And that continued until there were bullets. Changed the world. 